What's up, everybody? Appreciate you joining me for this live stream review of the Numi BS5P. If you saw my review last month of the speaker, you could tell that I was not happy with it. And quite frankly, it was just terrible. Um, the story goes that Numi saw my review. They reached out and said, hey, that's not at all what we planned on doing. And um, let us do some things, work some things in the background, and we'll get back to you. So they did that. And they came out with a couple of new EQ editions and they sent me the link and said, would you mind retesting? And I said, sure, you know, for you guys, I don't mind doing that because I feel like with the passive version that I tested last year, it was excellent and it's worth pursuing this, you know, maybe as a joint effort to provide the community with a great budget speaker for 150 bucks a pair. Uh, it has RCA input, coaxial, uh, toss link optical, and what else is there? Let me look. Got it handy. Mm. Uh, Bluetooth. Bluetooth was the other thing. So with that said, that's what we're going to go over today is some of those modifications that I had made uh, based on the firmware and then also what I've done to the ports. I've stuffed them. And before I start doing that, let me just check the chat to make sure that everybody can see me and everything is going well. Uh, no audio out of the right channel. Yeah, it's something weird. I'll have to look into this and see. Uh, what's going on here? Let me check real fast. Hopefully that will fix it. And I apologize in advance for that. Uh, this streaming app is sometimes a little bit wonky. And that's the thing that happens when you go live. You run into little things here and there. Uh, but let me know if that fixed it. Hopefully that will have taken care of it for everybody. And I'm going to check a couple other things before I keep rolling through here. And all right. So with all of that said, I'm going to go ahead and pull up my website. And if you have any questions as I go, I probably won't be able to uh, see them as I'm, as I'm talking in real time. So maybe just hold them until the end or type them up and then copy and paste them somewhere and bring them back up to me a little bit again later on. And with that said, let's see here. I'll go ahead and throw this screen up real fast. Hope you guys are doing well, guys and girls, if I've got any uh, females who are into audio, got to get everybody. And, oh, that was a fail. <laughs> All right. Take two. Chrome tab. New me. There we go. You all should be able to see the, uh, the screen now. No more technical difficulties. Uh, left channel. Yeah, I can't really do anything about the channel inputs here. It's just how it is. And um, I'll probably need to buy like a splitter or something for this because it's actually only going into the left channel right now. So I'll probably have to clean that up in post or something, but we'll see. Uh, at any rate, so let's look at the Numi BS5P. This is it. If you haven't seen it before, if you missed my previous review, I wouldn't even worry about going back and watching it. It is a five inch, you know, mid range, mid woofer, and then a one inch dome tweeter. I uh, don't know what is this, you know, carbon fiber maybe on the, on the cone. I don't know. I don't keep up with this stuff to be honest with you. Uh, and you'll notice I've stuffed the ports with some egg crate foam. And why did I do that? Uh, we're going to talk about that on the back. There are the inputs and outputs. And as I said, you can see the, what is this, coaxial, optical, left, right, analog. Uh, and then it has a little speaker out. Because while this is a powered speaker, what you do is you power, you know, you run power into the one unit, the main unit, and then you run speaker level out or speaker wire out uh, to the other speaker. And that's how you power the other speaker. So uh, only one speaker really, I guess, is powered and the other one is passively amplified, if you want to say it that way. Uh, and with that all said, we are at the Spinorama tab on my website, which is aaronsaudiocorner.com. And this is where I talk about, you know, the Clipple near field measurement system. And that's what I use to measure the response of all the speakers that I test. And if you're curious to learn a little bit more about it, you can go and click this link and watch the interview that I did with one of their designers, Christian Bellman, who is a genius. This is a picture of the speaker on the stand. And actually, this is from the last round of testing that I did. I think I have a newer photo of it. And then here is some information about how it was tested. So the speaker was tested with a microphone placed between the tweeter and the mid-range as a state to do 
in the um, manual itself. Let me get some water here from Go Sparse. All right. And a uh, single RCA input was used. Volume was set to whatever the default volume is when it when it's powered up. And I did not use the grill because these do come with grills, but I didn't test it with the grill. All the testing was done per the CEA 2034 standard. And if you want to read about that, I have a link here. You can go and actually download that standard. And then here's where I get into the meat of this test. Right here, I talk about the different EQ settings. So factory EQ is basically how the speaker was sent to me by default, except for the speaker was sent to me with the tweeter wired in reverse polarity. And I probably should have caught that in my review, but to be honest, I was so disappointed by the results that I was just ready to get that one off the table. The company reached out and said, this definitely doesn't match what we measured. Um, so we don't question your measurement, we just question the unit. And long story short, I have switched the polarity on the tweeter and it got a much better response, but it still wasn't nearly as good as it could have been. They also reached out and said, hey, we've uh, made two EQ settings. And if you don't mind, if you have the time, would you be willing to try them out? Let us know what you think. So I tried both of them out and I liked one in particular. And then I went another step, which is where I went to uh, stuffing the ports. And I will say that in order to update the equalizer, so let's say you've already got these speakers or you're considering purchasing them, because what I can tell you right now is I don't know what EQ they're coming out of the factory with as of today. Um, you know, maybe before today, maybe they, they haven't changed anything up to this point. And maybe now they're changing things based on, you know, this review or my previous review. Um, but let's say that you got it with a factory EQ and you go and you need to update the EQ with the new firmware. It's really quite easy. If you're at all familiar or comfortable with just using a screwdriver, there's a few screws on the back of this unit. You take the, the screws out and you just kind of pry off the amp. Very, very easy, not dangerous. And it's got a little USB slot. You just plug a little USB cord in there. They've got directions on their website, which I've linked somewhere in this review, and I'll try to remember to throw it in the description below. But with all of that, you just update the firmware to whichever EQ version you want. And I would recommend what they're calling the updated EQ. And it is dated uh, May 4th, 2021 on their website. And then the next step I would recommend is to stuff the ports. But this lists all the different measurements that I've done. So in total, I've measured the speaker five times. I measured it my initial round, and then I measured it four times in this round. We're really only gonna focus on the fourth result down here but I do provide the first three spin data sets. All right, whoo, that's a long run right there. Ooh. Okay, so the first spin data set, I'm gonna scroll right back up here, is what they're calling the factory EQ. And this is after I had flipped the polarity back to the way it should have been when I received it. Um, and as you can see, you know, it's, it's really not bad initially, and I don't have it here, and I'm not gonna go backtrack and find it, but initially when I measured the speaker, there was a huge suck out right in the one to two to three kilohertz region. And that was due to the polarity being uh, out of alignment on the tweeter. But flipping that back around, you know, leveled off the response a good deal more and got me back more in line with what I expected to achieve when I initially got the speaker. And now we're going to go on to the next step, which is what they're calling the flat EQ, which is with all of their DSP, excuse me, disabled uh, on the amplifier itself. And as you can see, you know, it's actually worse. So between the flat EQ and the factory EQ that is sent to me, the factory EQ is better. Then the third test that I'd done was with their updated EQ. And this really smoothed things off. I mean, quite a bit. It's, it's much more linear now than it was ever before, but we still have some pretty significant cancellation effects from the ports. And how do I know it was for ports? Well, that was pretty easy. I just stuffed the ports and then I remeasured. And this is what we have now. Look how much smoother this response is. Now, you know, on a, on a whole, if you're looking at this, I was really impressed. If we could get rid of this one kilohertz, 900 hertz region, that, that bump, because it's wide Q, so it's going to be audible. If you can get rid of that, uh, that, this response would be just really, really flat. I'm really impressed with this. Again, the speaker's 150 bucks, prepare, powered. Uh, as far as hiss goes, because somebody did ask and I forgot to address that before, they do have a little bit of hiss to them, 
Uh, it's not anything that would, you know, give me incredible pause, uh, especially because you're spending $150 on the pair. So you're probably a little bit more forgiving on them. If you're listening near field and it's very quiet, then you're going to hear the hiss. Or if you turn up the gain really loud, you're going to hear the hiss. So just keep that in mind. Uh, purchase wherever you can. I think maybe right now they're only sold through Amazon. So I would purchase them and you could always send them back if it was just unbearable for you. And I will drop an affiliate link on the description below. If you don't mind, you know, going through the affiliate link and helping my channel out. It doesn't cost you anything extra. So yeah, um, let's look at the on-axis response then. The roll-off now from, let's see here, this was ported. So you can see there's a little bit more of a, of a kink on the lower end. Uh, and it's really not that bad. But when you seal it up, that, that kink kind of smooths out. So you've got a much you know, more natural, I guess, base roll off. And you're still left with this 900 hertz region, as I said, but it's certainly not as bad as it was before. I mean, look how much smoother it is now. So much smoother. And I will tell you that if you're thinking, hey, I'll buy these and I'll probably still use them ported, uh, you can. But to my ears, it was certainly a noticeable difference as far as what I heard. Uh, the mid range just sounded more grainy for a lack of a better word, uh, when I was listening to a couple of my, my go-to tracks. So I still would always recommend stuffing the ports on this particular speaker. Uh, overall flatness, you know, is, is pretty good. I think we're about plus or minus 3 dB overall. I do have stats on that a little bit further down. The overall treble is, is pretty good, except for you've got a little boost around, maybe that's 6K or so. Um, and it's, you know, not very narrow Q, but it's not very, very wide. So maybe like a medium Q through that bandwidth. And then you've got a cancellation effect up in the higher frequencies. I'm not sure exactly what this is from, but it is showing in all the off axis measurements as well. So it is going to be, I guess, an issue as you go off axis and the sound is delivered to the rest of your room for near field listening. It's still going to be an issue because it shows up in on axis. So it is a problem in all axes. Now looking at the directivity indices in the blue dash line down here, we can see that all the sound is radiated frontward because it's not going below the DI offset line, which is this gray line. And that makes sense because it's got a front woofer and it's got front ports. So you wouldn't expect anything to be negative on the directivity indices. And we can see that we're trending upward and then around maybe seven, 800 Hertz, you kind of take a jump. And I'm not really sure what that jump is, but once you take that jump, then you start to narrow up a little bit more. So I think there's something going on here that is probably radiating omnidirectionally and it's making this appear not as smooth, if that makes sense. Um, and I know my, my mouse isn't showing, so I'll try to call out the frequencies here. Uh, what I'm talking about is in the 800 to uh, 7, 800 Hertz region on the blue dash line at the bottom. And, you know, you can see you're kind of flat and then you start to go up in response into about two kilohertz. Then when you get to two kilohertz, that dash line starts to narrow back or dip back down in response. And that's because the radiation pattern is getting wide because that's where the tweeter is coming into play. So the directivity matching at the crossover region is not great. Uh, it could definitely be better. But again, I'm kind of trying to weigh the fact that we have you know, $150 bookshelf speaker, and it's powered, and it's got all these things going for it, that might offset the uh, total, you know, inaccuracy of the speaker as a whole. But all of that said, I still think it's a really good uh, overall response. So this is the early reflections breakout, and I'm really not going to get into this because, frankly, it's just something that I don't spend a lot of time on myself. And this is the estimated in-room response. Now, Remember that these are all far field. If you're using the speaker near field, and I'm not saying it's design, designed that way, but I'm just saying if you're listening to them, you know, kind of close within a meter or so, then this is going to be a little bit different. Uh, maybe not too much different, but it's going to weigh more toward the on axis response as opposed to the off axis response influence. But what we can see is pretty much what you would expect when you go and look at the other data. And it's very interesting that overall the response is flat and then it's just a shelf. And then it's kind of flat, but it trends back up. So what you can expect and what I did here when I was listening a little bit further away is more of a bright sounding speaker. Um, and I don't want to use the word bright as in it sounds like, oh my gosh, it takes your head off like you know some bright speakers do. But it is a little bit more bright. It's just more treble heavy. 
uh, a couple of EQ fixes or a couple of EQ bands off APO if you're running these off a computer or if you have a mini DSP or even like Odyssey on a receiver would or should clean that clean that right up, I would think, because the directivity is pretty good if I remember uh, in that region. Yeah, it kind of, they all kind of track pretty well together. So I think you'd be okay in that regard, but just keep that in mind. Let's see here. Uh, this is the horizontal off-axis response, and generally I'm just trying to make sure that the off-axis response tracks the on-axis. Uh, and it kind of does, but there are some areas where the response bunches up. And when the response bunches up, what I mean is around this 800 hertz, 700 hertz region, uh, directly below the 30 degree line. So hopefully this mouse is showing up. Uh, the, the, all the off axis measurements are kind of stacking on top of each other. They're all just closing in on each other. And that generally indicates a resonance. And I'm not sure what that would be. Potentially a standing wave. Could even be a basket resonance. I, I really just don't know. I'm not sure that it matters, to be frank. Um, then when you go off axis again, you can see as you go higher in frequency that overall the off axis response trends pretty well. I mean, it's, it's just reduced in level as you go further and further off axis. So I think that's pretty good. Uh, the vertical response. So, well, actually we back up the SPL horizontal response. Generally what you want to take away from this is, you know, how far off axis can I be with this, with the speaker? And I would say with this speaker, you know, zero degrees on axis is probably about where you want to be. Uh, because if you go any further than maybe 10 or 20 degrees off axis, when you get to 30, which is in the yellow, uh, when you get above eight kilohertz, the response starts to diverge more than three dB. And that may be somewhat problematic for some people. Uh, I think on axis or 10 degrees off axis is probably the best way to go. Now we're going to look at the vertical response. And what I'm seeing here is just don't go above or below the speaker more than 10 degrees. Uh, the red and the dark red indicate that and actually don't go below the speaker Man, actually maybe even at all because this dashed red line is telling me that there's an issue with the crossover so stay on axis or right above the tweeter line or right above the midpoint between the tweeter and the mid woofer but don't go uh, any further below that or any further above that point point. and let's see here this is the contour plots which I'm going to blow right through these and I'm going to pick these up in a little bit. Now, this is the on-axis linearity. Same on-axis response that you saw earlier, except it's just given to you with some bounds. And the gray is plus or minus one and a half dB. If the speaker is within that region throughout the main you know, bandwidth of it, then that's really good. The blue is the plus or minus three dB window. And if the speaker's response is within that throughout its man, main bandwidth, then that's pretty good. It's not great, but it's, you know, decent, I guess, decent enough. Um, and for 150 bucks, I'm, I'm actually pretty impressed with the overall response. Again, you've got this bump around 900 Hertz. That's kind of going wild. And then you've got a couple little things in the higher frequency area, but I mean, that's literally just two bands of EQ and you've got yourself a response that's within plus or minus one, one and a half DB with just two simple bands of EQ. Uh, that's, that's pretty darn good. Okay, so now this is going to be the off-axis radiation, and what I'm looking for here is to see, you know, how uh, smooth is the radiation pattern on the speaker, and how, I guess, in line is it? Does it always stay within that same angle, or is it diverging in angle? Meaning that, is it always staying within plus or minus 40 degrees, or is it going 40, 50, 70, 40, and then bouncing around, you know, kind of looking through this plot? And what I'm seeing here is basically what I normally see in the lower frequencies. It's essentially omnidirectional. Uh, there's some extra stuff being radiated toward the back, which I do find kind of interesting because there's no speaker back there. It almost makes me wonder if there's something vibrating inside that is causing the radiation or the sound energy to be radiated more at the back of the speaker. Um, but without further you know, digging, I, I, I don't know what would actually be the cause here. As you go higher in frequency, we can see that the red is kind of bouncing around. So the overall radiation pattern isn't consistent. It is not constant, um, which would be more ideal because generally speaking, you want the same radiation pattern throughout. Not necessarily saying that it has to be, you know, plus or minus 10 degrees or plus or minus 90 degrees, but you want it to be within the same bounds throughout because that way it's spreading the same amount of energy uh, equally into the room rather than some frequencies are going to be bounced off the sidewalls at a different angle than other ones. 
and then that's going to mess with the overall tonality of the sound stage. Uh, and then let's see here, the vertical globe. So this tells me what I'm looking at here, negative 10 dB or negative 10 degrees down here, uh, plus 10 degrees. So if you go up to 30 degrees, you are definitely encroaching on the uh, crossover phase issues. If you go below 10 degrees, it's the same story there. So ideally, you're going to want to stay in this zero to maybe plus 10 degree window. And it actually looks from this that somewhere in that area, maybe even the 10 degree window above might be more linear. So that, that would be interesting to dig around a little bit more into. So my suggestion there would be, like I said before, just put the, the reference plane, which again is the mid and the tweeter center point, put that online with your ear. And if you need to move it a little bit above or below, try to go above it, but no more than 10 degrees. Harmonic distortion, this is where things get a little bit hairy. Uh, 80, 60 B at one meter, not bad actually. It's below 1% THD mostly, uh, which is the negative 40 dB line. The interesting thing that stands out to me though is in the mid range, you've got some higher order harmonics that are peaking here. And when I went to 96 dB, you're not seeing those higher order harmonics peaking to the degree that they were before. Now everything's just kind of stacked on top of each other. And the overall output uh, or the overall distortion is increased by, I don't know, what, what 10 dB. So now you're above 3% THD throughout the mid range. And I will say that I heard that these speakers, in my opinion, uh, based on what I'm seeing in the data and what I heard is that you don't want to listen to these in the far field at, mm, at loud levels. And by loud, I would say that I would try to keep this within for a stereo pair. I would ballpark it at maybe 90 dB at a few meters, but I wouldn't go any louder than that. If you have to go uh, up to four meters and really you probably just need to be looking at a different speaker if you need to be listening loud and from a far distance. So let's see, near field response. Who cares about this? Doesn't matter right now. Uh, this is the compression test. So I will say that I did not do my short term compression testing on this because I honestly just forgot and I had taken everything down and I really just didn't feel like going back and doing it again. I do have that for my previous test. If you want to go look at that, the results essentially were that when you got to, I think, 96 dB, um, the instantaneous compression was rather high which just solidified the fact that you don't need to be listening to these loud levels uh, or at long distances. So with the long-term compression to 86 dB, where I run for two minutes and then I test and then I run for four minutes and then I test, overall, no, nothing to complain about here. Looks good to me. 96 dB is a different story where you've got almost one dB of compression after about four minutes. Minutes, minutes, minutes. So if you're listening to this speaker for a long time at loud levels, the frequency response is going to change. And this is kind of how it's going to start changing. It's going to change to the mid range and in the high frequencies as well. So past seven kilohertz. And that really is it for my parting thoughts. I'll just kind of blow through this and see. Um, this is kind of where I talk about what I heard. I do suggest that you stuff the ports and use their updated EQ set setting. And then I also ran this through REW's automatic EQ builder and the outputs were this, just three bands of EQ and it put it within plus or minus 2 dB target window. I thought that's pretty darn awesome. And that's it. So let me move this back over here. And I am talking now. Okay, so that's it for the review. Um, if you need understanding of trying to figure out, you know, what this data means or how to read it, I've done a whole series of that. I will put it in the description or I'll try to link it somewhere, but it's a whole playlist that tells you how to read frequency response, how to read compression charts, how to read, uh, what else? Yeah, everything I've done, basically the directivity, what off axis means. And I did that intentionally. So I wouldn't have to go through all that over and over and over and over here in this review. And it makes it easy on me. And now we're able to blow through things relatively quickly, talk about the high points and get straight through the data. And now if anybody has any questions for me, uh, I will read through these and see what I've got here. But I guess the one thing I do need to point out again, I, I really want to stress this, is that I was really happy with Numi for making the effort to contact me and to say, hey, first of all, we appreciate that you made these measurements. We're not doubting your measurements, but would you be willing to you know, work with us to try to figure out what's going on between 
what we sent you, what we expected to send you and what you got. And I'm pretty much willing to do that with any company that's open to do something like that. As long as I don't feel like they're just using me um, or using my near fill scanner and Numi has their own measurement methods. So I don't think that was the case at all here. I think they were genuinely just trying to make a better product. And based on my previous experience with them, um, I was more than happy to do that to get to the bottom of it because I really wanted to be able to recommend this speaker. But based on that last round, there was no way I was going to do that. But now I can confidently say if you are willing to stuff the ports and if you are willing to make the EQ adjustment uh, via their little web editor app thing, go to their online page and then download what you need to do, which I promise truly is very quite simple. Uh, it, I don't know that there's anything better right now, at least for 150 bucks. Uh, they really are truly what I think is probably the best value out there. And that's after testing a bunch of other low budget type speakers the past couple of weeks. Uh, the JBL 305 MK2 had internal resonance that lit up like crazy around you know, 150 to 250. There's a couple spots in those regions. Turns out that other people have had those kind of issues. I tested some Mackie. I tested the Presona speakers this week. They were 100 bucks a pair. And yeah, you think you're only spending that much money. You're not expecting greatness. But I think Numi is kind of the exception to that. Yeah, I didn't get a great result the first time. And they said, dude, we can fix this. They fixed it. And now look what we've got. So I recommend it if you're in the market for something like that. Now, uh, let me see if I've got any questions here. Uh, da, 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 da. How do you add a sub? Okay, yeah, this is a good question. I'm glad you asked this because I meant to, I meant to address this. There is no sub out on the speaker. And you're going to need some kind of, you know, an AVR. Or if you get something like the mini DSP 2x4, which... It used to be 99 bucks. I don't know if it still is, but if it still is, I would definitely recommend that. If you're looking for like a computer type setup, you could go that route very easily. Uh, just a few bands of EQ will, will fix the new me's quite well. And then that will give you the option of adding a subwoofer and you can run an active little setup, active two way, well, active monitors plus subwoofer. And by active, I just mean DSP crossover network. Um, or you can go the AVR route and, and do that, which I think would be fine too. Most modern receivers, well, not modern receivers, most receivers, you can go to the thrift store and probably buy one with a sub out and a simple uh, Linkwitz Rally fourth order electronic slope built into it. You can cross it on 80 and, and be good to go. Let's see. So yeah, I appreciate you asking that, Dominic. That, that was a good question. I didn't mean to address that. The volume controls in the speaker. Yeah, you can just, so what I was doing when I was listening to them is I would just set the speaker volume to not quite max because when I hit max, that's when you start hearing the hiss, but I would set it to almost max. And then if I was running Bluetooth, I would just control the volume through my phone. Or if I was running it out of my computer speakers, then I would just control the, the volume out of my Motu M2, which is what I use for all my, my speakers and stuff like that. Uh, let's see here. If you're buying, I doubt you buy a sub mini DSP. Yeah, uh, that's a and that's a very good point. So there's that aspect of if you can only afford to buy $150 speakers, then you're probably not going to buy other things to go along with it. But on the flip side, there might be somebody that says, "I've got, you know, four or five hundred bucks, and I really want to make the best little system I can off of that budget." And I think these speakers and that Elac Sub 1010, which I tested last summer. Uh, with a mini DSP would put you, that's 110, 360, 99. That's all under 500 bucks uh, shipped, actually. So I think that would be a way to go if that's kind of the, the budget range that you're looking at. But no, I agree. that, And that's a good point. Uh, compared to the passive speaker that I tested. So if you go and look back at the review, um, what is it? They're, they're flat that would essentially be what the passive speaker is. There's no EQ built into that flat setting. Yep. Yep, that's true. These are a good sound bar for TV. Hey, Chris, dude, I appreciate the, uh, the five bucks, man. That's awesome, dude. I appreciate that. Um, these are a good sound bar. So that's the thing, man. I want to get into testing sound bars too. 
the problem is that some of them are Bluetooth only, and I don't have the means, or I, I say Bluetooth only. Some of them are HDMI only. Some of them have Bluetooth, but the majority of them that I've seen, like the ones that I've been interested in, they don't have an auxiliary input or a standard RCA. Now, a lot of them should, but the few that I've been really interested in, they don't have that. So I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to test that. Additionally, with the way that sound bars are, you know, they're supposed to be left or right. Um, they're not really working mono. So that's the thing that's been kind of bugging me in the back of my brain. I'm like, okay, so when I do test it, what am I testing for? Am I just testing for left or right? Do I try to somehow send it a mono signal and, and test it that way? Uh, and then what about the ones that have like the five channel, you know, built into it where they have the array and all the, the DSP stuff built into it. So that's something that I'm, I'm unsure of, but there are a couple that I do have on my list that I have requested for BM8, B and H to test. And I'm hoping that I can do that. So unfortunately, I don't know if I can answer this question just yet, but if it were me today, I, I might lean toward a sound bar simply because it's easier to hide. You can just put it right underneath the TV. I mean, these aren't, here, put it next to my head. So they're bigger than my head. I mean, and I don't have a huge cranium. At least I don't think I do at least. Uh, but they're kind of harder to hide. I mean, a sound bar is a lot easier to hide. Sound wise, these are definitely going to be better than a sound bar. I can't imagine a little two inch, you know, thick sound bar having much of output at all. But if you're trying to go for something for the aesthetic of it and maybe just better sound than the TV speaker, sound bar might be the way to go. I just, I really don't know yet, to be honest with you, man. No, no, no. Yes, kudos to Numi. I do have to give them a shout out for that. Uh, I need somebody here like to uh, to talk or to sing while I'm going through these. Most hubs have built in crossovers. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point too. A lot of them do have that built in. Um, so yeah, that's that's another way to go too. Will Numi be making a non-ported? Jason, what's up, buddy? Uh, will Numi be making a non-ported version? Also, any chance they would develop what they have given? Uh, I'll give him my tool. Hold on. So I sent them, I, I typed up the review last night and I sent them the link to it because the way that, this has all worked and the way it always will work is I'm not working with anybody to, to like in behind the scenes, like it's always out front. So when Numi sent me the speakers initially, I threw out the review. It was a terrible review. I mean, I thought it was a good review, but the product was terrible. And then I sent them the link. They didn't have any idea what I thought about the speaker going into it. Same deal with this second round of testing. They had no idea that I had even finished the review. I just dropped in the link. So I saw they replied to me, excuse me, this morning in the email. And they actually did say that they will consider providing uh, ports, like a phone port to plug up their, or I, I'm sorry, a phone plug to plug up the ports uh, when they send out, you know, not newer models, but more models. So I don't know if they're going to do that, but they said they were going to consider doing that. And I would recommend that they do. And I think I wouldn't be surprised actually, if they would just make a few little EQ changes to uh, the response that I got based off of that, I mean, they're like three EQ bands away from making not a perfect speaker, but bar none, the best budget power speaker that I can think of. I mean, I, I can't think of anything that comes close to that in the $150, $200 range. And I'm not sure that anything could touch it at 300 bucks either. Uh, you, you'd have to get to more money before you get close to that kind of, that kind of response. Uh, let's see here. Do I recall the retail price of the flat audio? Cole, is this directed toward me? Um, because, so here's the deal. If I, if this is directed toward me, so the speaker is shipped to you as is with the standard EQ from last year when they developed the, the product. Um, but if you want to flash it, it's just a download. It's a firmware flash. You just download it, plug it in, plug the speaker board into your computer via USB and you just flash it with whatever EQ you want to do, and it doesn't cost you anything extra at all. 
I have no idea, man. I, I mean, I could look, I could take it apart and look, but it's probably not anything that's great. Maybe. I really don't know. I wonder who's going to be the first to reverse engineer the DSP config and create their own settings. Um, well, so actually on Audio Science Review, when I post the data, there's a couple guys that will, I'll post the graphics and then I'll also post the raw data. And what they do is they take that raw data and they'll generate their own EQ bands out of it. And a couple of guys have already done that. And this speaker, they've made it a lot better. And the idea is that you would, you know, plug it into APO or mini DSP or whatever DSP you have available. And then there you go. So yeah, some guys have already done that based on the data that I provided. That's pretty cool. Thanks for doing this for them. Now we have a better speaker for the budget. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I did it. Um, you know, the whole spiel I gave earlier, I was, I was happy to, to do this, you know, go the extra mile, I guess, and, and try to, you know, resolve the issue and provide us all with a much better product in the end. Yeah, I agree. And it surely wouldn't cost them, but you know, a few pennies, a free pair of socks. Yeah. I mean, good thing I had that old nasty foam around. And the funny thing about it is I keep like a tub with all sorts of things for my car audio, you know, my car audio days, but like for my car audio projects. And one of those tubs is just foam, egg crate, uh, mass load of vinyl, CLD, all that kind of stuff is just in a big old tub. And this foam was in, it was mixed in with polyfill. So it had like white strands of polyfill just covering all over it. <laughs> it's pretty funny. I actually had to pick all the polyfill off before I took a picture and I don't think I got all of it. Oh, you mean, so when you said flat, you mean the non-power version? Um, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's still 89 bucks, but if you give me a second, let me pull this up. I'm actually going to Google this for you right now. New me BS five. Let's see here. Okay. Yep. New me BS five is, well, it's now it's 99 bucks. When I, First ordered them, they were uh, 90 bucks last summer. And look at this. Holy cow. They're on sale for $130. Wow. $130? Bucks? Dude, these were $150 like a couple days ago. That's sweet. All right, let me, let me get rid of that. Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't know that they brought the price down. Woo woo. Cool. All right. Uh, I'm going to roll back through here and see if I missed anybody's comments. And Chris, again, I just want to thank you for the, I think these are called super chats. So thank you, man. I appreciate that. That's awesome, dude. That will, uh, that will buy me lunch tomorrow while I'm at work. Cause I won't have time to make my dinner tonight. <laughs> Not have to do this. Uh, and if you guys have any other questions, go ahead and feel free to ask. Cause, uh, I don't want to waste too much of your time and, We'll bell up out of here soon if we need to. I missed this one. Is that a green power light? Yeah. So this, the power light has different colors. Uh, when you first turn it on, it defaults to Bluetooth input. So the, the power light is blue. Uh, green is auxiliary. And then there's like a, like a purplish and a reddish. And one of those is for the coaxial or phono. And then the other one is for the coaxial or phono. I don't know which one's which, but I think it has four different colors total kind of in that order. Yeah, uh, the mono, so this, about the audio of this thing. Yeah, I don't actually have that. Um, yeah, I'll have to do, I'll have to figure out what I can do. So when I make my videos, not live ones, but when I actually go through and edit them, I always have to mix it down to mono before I kick it out. I'll have to figure out some way to do that if I'm going to continue to do live stuff, but maybe there's something else I can do on later. Okay. There is a master slave. Um, yeah, kind of, if you want to consider it that on the back of it, you know, the one unit is just the powered version. And then at the bottom, you can see where it says speaker out and the little tabs. I'll try to point to it. Yeah. Right down there. So that sends power out to the other one. Now, that's just like a passive speaker on the other one. I haven't looked, but do these powered versions have the 
DAC built in. Yeah. Um, what was that? I can't remember what the what the sampling frequency is. And I may have mentioned it in my other reviews. But it does. Yeah, it does. I just don't recall what the what the specs were for it. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, I want to say it was like 40, no, maybe 90, 24 bit, 96 kilohertz. That might be it, but I, I should be on their website. I don't recall. Well, cool. All right. Well, Hey, if any of you guys have any other questions, let me know. I'm gonna give it like one, one or two more minutes, uh, just to make sure you can get them in if you have any, and otherwise I'll, I'll bail up out of here. I was wondering if there's much of a difference, the one with the amp versus the passive since you measured. Yeah, no, there's not. I actually measured the other one, uh, the first round of testing that I did because I wanted to see if it was still having some of the same issues, which I thought were the port resonance. And I also tested that one specifically so I could run an impedance sweep on it and overlay that with the on it or the frequency response to see where those things lined up. Because usually when you have both, it's very easy to tell what's going on uh, as far as you know, standing wave or port resonance, or if there's an acoustical interference, maybe like the tweeter wave guide or something like that. I mean, those are the kind of things that you look for and, and are separate from the impedance in most cases. So yeah, as far as, as far as I could tell in my previous round of testing, the passive is the same thing as the powered. It just, the powered is, it's just got the power built into it. And it has probably that long of a line of cord running into the passive crossover because these are not active speakers. They are passive speakers with the amplifier built into them. No idea, but uh, based on their time that they take to reply or the times that they typically reply to me, uh, I would say probably U.S., maybe at least that's where they're replying from because when they reply, it's always within uh, like typical business hours for me. But I don't know where their, you know, their headquarters is. I don't really know anything about them, to be honest. Uh, first album. I don't know. I'll have to try it one more time. You get it? Did you get it? I hope you got it. <laughs> Jason, Jason got it before I even said it. All right, cool. You guys are funny. You guys make me laugh. You guys are funny. Do I amuse you? Am I funny like a clown? All right. All right, guys. Well, I think that that is it. So I'm a, I'm a jet. Um, I appreciate you watching, appreciate you joining me and yeah, this is good. This is a, it's a lot easier to do this than it is to sit down and edit a video. So I will see y'all later. And, uh, if you're curious about buying these, I'm going to do the cheap shameless plug. I'm going to throw an Amazon affiliate link down there. If you want to buy them, please consider buying them through that because it helps me out and it gets me like two or 4%, something like that. It's not a lot, but you know, if I could sell, like a thousand of these through an affiliate link, then that would be great. Uh, and you guys know that I'm not shilling because the first round of testing, I said, don't buy them. And the last four speakers that I've tested, I've said, don't buy. So I'm happy just to have something that I can finally recommend. Cause I'll tell you, I was getting burnt out on uh, testing junk. And ironically, I just tested another piece of crap that I've got to do a review for too. It's like a Donis or Donnie or something. I don't know. I keep trying to find diamonds in the rough and they're all just rough. None of them are diamonds. So anyway, all right, well, I'll talk to y'all later. Take care. Peace. Let me go click this end stream button. Oh, I said peace. Good, good. All right, y'all take care. Peace.